This is the Biz News Podcast, one-on-one conversations with experts in business and personal development. The nation's economy, if not the world's economy, is facing a severe downturn. So says economist Murray Sabrin, who's an advocate for free markets. He says he thinks we're going to have a recession this year because we have the inverted yield curve, where short-term interest rates are above long-term rates. He says historically when that happens, within a year or so, a recession hits. And he says, quoting him, there's a good chance we'll have a recession in 2023. Mr. Sabrin explains his outlook in this edition of Biz News Interviews. Where do you see the nation headed this year and in the next few years in this regard? Well, uh, if you look at what the Federal Reserve has been doing in terms of manipulating interest rates, uh, creating trillions of dollars uh, in 2020 to uh, fend off uh, the COVID lockdowns, uh, that money was injected into the economy. And now we're seeing the, uh, the results of that with the uh, very high inflation rate we had for 2021, 2022, I should say. And now inflation has somewhat uh, receded. We're only at 7% instead of 9%, which we were in the summer of uh, 2022. And um, the Fed has been raising rates in order to damper price increases. We know gasoline prices have collapsed since the summer. I mean, it was at $5 or more a gallon. Now we're at uh, $3 and change. So that's good for the uh, consumer's pocketbook. Food prices, however, are still at very elevated levels. The question is, will they continue to increase? Remember, inflation is the rate of change. Think of the inflation as your speedometer in your car. The faster you go, the higher inflation goes, the higher prices go. But if you keep prices, if the, if you keep the speedometer at 50, that means prices are going to be elevated. They're not going to recede if you step, you f- take your foot off the gas and prices come down. So we, we, we're in a period of high prices. We know uh, housing prices have been soft recently because mortgage rates have gone through the roof from 3% a year ago to 6 7% today. Auto sales are starting to soften as well. So these big ticket items are having an impact on, on the consumer price index. But the things that people buy on, an, on a day-to-day basis, food, uh, utilities, uh, insurance, um, things like that, those prices are still elevated. And the question is, will they continue to increase or will they stay at a high level? If they stay at a high level, then inflation will be zero because there won't be any year-to-year change from uh, six months ago. So that's the tricky part about inflation. It's a dynamic rate of change concept. And uh, right now, people are worried about inflation. Wages are not keeping up with inflation. So th- th- there's a problem there, obviously. And uh, we'll see how this uh, uh, year unfolds. I think we're going to have a recession this year because we have the inverted yield curve where short-term rates went and above long-term rates. And historically, when that happens, within a year or so, a recession hits. And so when the yield curve inverted last year, uh, there's a good chance we'll have a, a recession in 2023. And it really depends on how fast the uh, interest rates go up because if short-term rates keep on going up that means it's going to be very tough for companies to uh, maintain their current level of production and sales and that's when uh, the economy rolls over well the thing is the federal reserve uh, manipulates interest rates uh, creates trillions of dollars of new money and this uh, causes distortions inflation um, uh, over expansion in various sectors of the economy and then when the fed cuts back on its uh, holdings of government debt, which is the which is the foundation for creating new money, uh, then uh, businesses have to adjust to the new reality. And, and this is why people have argued for the Fed to either cease and desist their operations in order to manipulate interest rates or to go out of business completely and just allow uh, the banking system to have free banking like we had in a good part of the 19th century. Uh, it wasn't perfect, but the point is we didn't have these huge boom bust cycles back then. It's only since the Federal Reserve was created that we've had these massive boom busts and uh, we've lived through two bubbles. And now what we have is what uh, some analysts have called the everything bubble. Everything has been inflated, stocks, bonds, real estate, artwork. And uh, this is just a not sustainable model for an economy. And uh, and uh, I'm just amazed that people in Washington still don't get it. it just shows you how economic ideology trumps good economics and that's why i think where we are today is that uh, 
it's so embedded in our economy that uh, the, we need a master in Washington to pull the strings of the economy when uh, it's entrepreneurship, Doug, that is the essence of uh, prosperity and capital formation. Those two combinations with sound money, with uh, low regulation or, or very little regulation will, will be, will, is the formula for a successful, sustainable prosperity. How would you uh, set up any bumpers around the uh, course for the cars to bump into and not uh, demolish themselves economically? In other words, to create soft downturns and perhaps yeah. ease upturns. Well, the thing is, um, every sector of the economy has natural cycles. We know that auto sales are very strong in the spring and the fall. They seem to uh, uh, calm down in the winter time when people are buying for the holidays and uh, uh, the weather is bad in the, in the northern parts of the country. So we know that there are seasonal patterns to housing as well. People go out and buy houses in the spring if they have a family so they can move in the summer so kids can go to the new school in September. So we know there are seasonal fluctuations to, to economic activity. But there's no such thing as free market boom and bust cycles. This is all created by this by central banking. It's been occurring for 200 years or more. And um, this is what I've been trying to do to educate the public uh, based upon my understanding of how money and banking and credit works and uh, and why we need free markets, because that is the engine of prosperity. It's not government spending. It's not uh, uh, ultra low interest rates artificially created by the Federal Reserve. And so um, I've been talking about this for literally a half a century. And uh, apparently the message hasn't got through to people in Washington. That's why I continue to do what I do, which is uh, be on great podcasts with you and to uh, and to write books and articles about all this uh, material. And back in the day, and the day wasn't too long ago, you ran for governor of New Jersey, did you not? How did that well, come about? Well, it was 25 years ago. What happened was I was minding my own business one Sunday afternoon when I got a call from the chairman of the uh, Libertarian Party saying um, the board uh, has gone through a, a list of people who we think could carry the Libertarian message in the governor's race. And I said, uh, so he called me and invited me to join. I said, well, this is not on my agenda in 1997. So I said, let me talk it over with my wife, the president of Ramapo College, where I was teaching at the time, the dean of the business school, to see if they would be okay with a faculty member running for governor. Uh, they all gave their blessing, so to speak. I decided uh, to run. I got the nomination um, in end of the, uh, March of 1997. And the goal was to raise enough money to get the state match, be part of the state matching fund program, which would then require me to be in the debates with the two major candidates. So to make a long story short, we, um, we, uh, we did that. Um, and we had a very short campaign because we didn't get approved for the matching funds till September 19th. And the election was in early November. And I got about uh, just under 5% of the vote, which is amazing when you consider that nobody in the state knew me as a political candidate. And, um, we had some influence, uh, Doug. You don't have to win uh, elections that influence public policy. Uh, four years after uh, Christy Whitman ran, uh, uh, won re-election, uh, Jim McGreevy uh, won the governorship, a Democrat, and he basically implemented my auto insurance plan, which is to deregulate the market. More companies came into the market, like Geico and others that left the New Jersey market because it was too constrictive, and insurance rates uh, went down. And we've never had an insurance rate problem in the state of New Jersey. Uh, Whitman um, and my and Jim McGreevy were opposed to raising the speed limit to 65, which we had in New Jersey, which was crazy. 55 speed limit in, uh, for cars is like, is like uh, in neutral. And so I said, we should have a 65 speed limit. And sure enough, six months after the election, Governor Whitman raised the speed limit to 65. In addition, uh, we had a case uh, for free speech in uh, during the campaign. That is not part of case law in New Jersey. I had a Sabrin for governor sign on my lawn. And one day when I came home, there was a note from a sergeant of the police department in my mailbox saying, you're in violation of such an such an audience ordinance in, uh, in town because your political signs are not allowed on your own property. So our campaign attorney went to the Superior Court uh, and the judge threw it out saying this is a gross violation of the First Amendment. And that's not part of case law. In the state of New Jersey, you can put your own political sign on your own property. So again, uh, the socialists never won any presidential election 
But Doug, if you look at the 1912 Socialist Party platform, virtually everything has been enacted in the United States. So you are a very good case to encourage young people, old people, middle-aged people to get off their duffs and get involved. Well, that's the whole point. If you make the statement, if you make a case for free markets, limited government, personal responsibility, uh, th those ideas eventually will uh, permeate through the society. And I've done so since then in books, articles, letters to the editor, radio and TV interviews. And so I think philosophically we're winning the game, but politically we're not because there's so many entrenched interests in Washington, D.C. that want to live off the $6 trillion budget that we have in Washington. And uh, it's not getting smaller, it's getting larger. And um, I'm convinced we're going to have a major financial crisis uh, within the next 10 years. And um, because I think we're in a similar situation where we had from the mid-60s to the early 80s, where inflation went from 1%, 2% during the Kennedy-Johnson years, all the way up to 12%, 13% in the first part of the Reagan administration, because the Federal Reserve just created so much money uh, during the uh, Carter administration, that money uh, uh, went into the economy and raised prices. I think we're going to see the same thing happen in the United States. Inflation has accelerated, it may decelerate, it may accelerate again, and we could have a major crisis because right now, Doug, what we didn't have 40 years ago is we have a lot of dollars overseas held by the Chinese, the Japanese, the Koreans, the Europeans, the OPEC nations. And when they lose confidence in our currency, when they lose confidence in our uh, treasury securities, that's when it's checkmate and they start to, to sell them the dollar goes down in value, interest rates go through the roof because there's not enough savings from those countries to buy our debt. And uh, and that's when we have to do our restructuring in the US. And I think there's enough um, goodwill out there. If people have been writing about how to restructure the US economy, uh, not so much from the private sector, but just from the public sector, which is absorbing 35% uh, or more of uh, wealth in this country every year with uh, their spending and regulation. And uh, there's a great op-ed on uh, in the Wall Street Journal by Bernie Marcus, the uh, co-founder of Home Depot. He said, uh, he writes in this op-ed that entrepreneurship is the key for, for uh, prosperity, especially in the minority communities. And this is what I've been saying for decades. And Bernie Marcus, who really uh, became an entrepreneur in his late 40s after he got laid off, uh, created one of the great iconic companies, Home Depot, uh, which is uh, in, has 2,000 locations, and he became a billionaire from one idea, put together all these uh, uh, parts of uh, gardening and uh, hardware stores in, under one roof, and uh, he ran with that idea, and he started in Atlanta, Georgia, and, and now he's one of the great success stories in American entrepreneurship. Uh, you indicated you thought we might have an economic uh, crisis in a decade or so. But yeah. what happens if uh, Congress uh, uh, gets into one of its stonewall uh, times with uh, people with strong ideologies refusing to uh, cooperate with the other party and we do not raise the debt ceiling uh, yeah. later this year? What happens then? Well, I think we're going to see the debt ceiling raise. This is the uh, kabuki game that they play in Washington, D.C., uh, both sides posture. And when the Republicans are in charge, the Democrats don't want to raise the ceiling. When the uh, Democrats are in charge, the Republicans don't want to raise the ceiling, but they eventually they raise the ceiling. What we have to do, Doug, is simply go through the six, $6 trillion budget, literally line by line, and say, what can... what government expenditures can better be done by the private sector or the nonprofit sector or the states and local governments and just start decentralizing all these activities of the federal government. Uh, the, the budget is so bloated, uh, there's so much pork in there of special interest spending that, and it doesn't reflect what the American people want because here, here is, I think, the dishonesty that's going on in America today. If the government spending is so great, why aren't the American people clamoring to have their taxes raised so we don't have this budget uh, deficit uh, that we have every year? We have these perpetual deficits uh, in the U.S. Uh, budget. So if spending is so good, why aren't economists saying people should pay their, their fa quote, fair share, whatever that is? I don't know what that means. But the point is, there's an there's a incredible dishonesty about our government spending, that if it's so good for the economy, 
We pay willingly for cable service, for food, for rent, for mortgages, for car loans, because we want these things. I don't think the American people want a $6 trillion budget, because if they did, they would say, raise our taxes because we want to pay our way so future generations are not burdened by this massive debt that's accumulated for 200 years. Now, that is not an easy segue into talking about your latest book, but would you tell our viewers and listeners a little bit about it? Well, my latest book is my autobiography that starts when I arrived in America in 1949 with my parents and older brother. And uh, I go through uh, getting an education in New York City, having wonderful teachers in K through 12, and then in uh, undergraduate school at Hunter College in the Bronx, and then at Lehman College for my master's, and at Rutgers for my PhD, and how I eventually got the career I wanted teaching uh, undergraduates in uh, at Rampo College beginning in 1985 in finance, which I don't have a degree in, but because of on the job training I had uh, in, in the investment field in commercial real estate in uh, economic analysis, uh, I was hired to teach finance and I taught that for 35 years. And the course that I love to teach was the financial history of the United States. So I have all of this data at my fingertips because I taught it for about a decade. And students love the course because it uh, gave them a perspective on how the U.S. economy evolved, how businesses evolved, how the financial markets uh, unfolded over, over a couple of centuries. And, and we uh, ended the course with the financial crisis of 2008, 2009. And what does that portend for the future since the Federal Reserve has just uh, opened up the monetary spigot the last uh, 12 years and created trillions of dollars? So uh, that's what the book uh, discusses, is how I evolved philosophically, politically from uh, the 1960s uh, during the height of the, uh, uh, or the beginning of the Great Society program and the Vietnam War, which had a huge impact. And of course, the Kennedy assassination, which occurred when I was a high school senior and how that impacted my view of uh, the world. And so um, uh, people uh, have given me wonderful compliments about it. In fact, uh, one of our former neighbors just spoke to my wife and says she he loved the book because it, uh, it's a down-to-earth book. It, it talks about the immigrant experience in America and um, how I embraced the principles that founded this country. I, I became U.S. citizen in 1959, Doug, raised my right hand and swore to uphold the Constitution. And I think I've done a much better job than presidents, members of Congress, and Supreme Court justices. Well, it's not too late for, for you to uh, uh, run for office again. Well, at, at my age and what I want to do now as in, the, in, in retirement, uh, I love doing what I'm doing is writing and speaking and, uh, and just educating. That's my forte. Is I was in a classroom for 35 years, and it's a great platform uh, to educate students, to, to, to lift their uh, intellectual abilities, to give them critical thinking skills, and to make them aware of how the world works, not how people think it should work, but how the world actually works, and what are the problems that we're facing from a financial perspective. And uh, again, uh, personal finance and public finance are very much related. We all want to pay our bills. We don't want to run up a lot of debt. And yet governments can do that because they have the ability to print money and have the central bank buy up this debt, which is not a great formula for uh, long-term prosperity. So if we were to crank up your uh, the saber and crystal ball into economics, where do you see the country uh, moving economically? Well, the wonderful part about America is that there's still enough economic freedom and entrepreneurship that the economy will continue to grow over the long term. That's where Warren Buffett and I are on the same page. I mean, you, you look at the economy. 30, 50, 100 years ago, and look at where it is today. Look at all the, the wonderful things we have. We were able to converse through the computer, which, which was unheard of years ago. And if it was available, it, it cost a fortune to do so. We can reach anyone by cell phone anywhere in the world, by, uh, and the cost is virtually zero. We, we can communicate with people um, at, at a fraction of the cost it was years ago. We have medical treatments today that, uh, that have improved uh, longevity for major illnesses. Um, we can buy something on Amazon eight o'clock in the evening and it's there the next day. That's unheard of. Years ago, Doug, you remember, we'd have to call it an 800 number uh, to order something and it would take a week, 10 days, two weeks to get here. Now Amazon seamlessly gets us products literally overnight. And um, it's, it's, it's a great business model. The logistics of Amazon is second to none. 
So we have all these wonderful companies out there, the Home Depots, the Costco's, uh, the Amazon's, uh, the uh, information system companies, um, all these retail operations online. Uh, this is why it's such a great opportunity for young people once they have one good idea. And this is something I stressed in all the years I taught business. If you have one good idea in America, you can make a great living. If you have one great idea like Bernie Marcus, you could become a billionaire. What would you like to add, uh, Murray, that we have not had a chance to talk about in this conversation? Well, what we desperately need in this country to get the $4 trillion healthcare bill down is medical entrepreneurship. That's the book that was published also last year, Financing of Healthcare. We can do a much better job than we have today with direct primary care, where people pay a monthly fee to see a doctor 24-7. Um, it's almost like concierge medicine, but at a much lower price. Uh, we have the Surgery Center of Oklahoma, which provides high quality surgery uh, for patients who don't have insurance at a fraction of what hospitals would charge. In other words, the interesting thing about medical care, Doug, is that we're overinsured. That's why we, we're spending $4 trillion a year on, in, on medical care. If we had direct payment, like we had back in the 50s when I was growing up, my parents would take me to the doctor, they paid $5 for the visit, we get a prescription for an antibiotic if we needed one. You go to the local pharmacy to pay a few dollars for antibiotic. No insurance, no co-pays. My father was a blue collar worker, not making a lot of money. And we could go to the doctor without having any problem. My father had a major operation in 1961 when he was a blue collar worker. Blue Cross Blue Shield took care of the bills. Uh, and that's the way it was back before we got Medicare and Medicaid and the expansion of employer based insurance. Insurance. Medical insurance is the only insurance we get through work. All the other insurances, we have a vibrant free market, whether it's property casualty, whether it's auto insurance, uh, other types of insurance that we pay for. It all comes through the free market and people can afford it. And the, and the way we deal with low income folks instead of having Medicaid is uh, create all these um, uh, volunteers and medicine centers around the world, I have, uh, around the country. I helped create one in Bergen County, New Jersey and uh, it provides uh, quality medical care at no cost to the patient and it's all based on voluntary contributions like we had the mutual aid societies uh, that were booming during the great uh, before the great depression but since the great depression the government has co-opted a lot of the nonprofits and built up this huge welfare state and we can do a lot better by by reducing taxes and uh, giving people incentives to have uh, these nonprofits uh, doctors love working in, in uh, these centers because there's no red tape. There are no insurance forms to fill out. They just practice good old fashioned medicine. Murray, give us the name of your new book, please. It's called From Immigrant to Public Intellectual, an American Story, available on Amazon. And the beauty about the book, Doug, is that the publisher has priced it so low to make it affordable for everybody in America, no matter what income you have, especially if you don't have a great income. It's only $6.99 for the paperback and $3.99 for the Kindle, which is incredibly inexpensive in today's uh, book marketplace where Kindles are going for $10, $15, $20, and paperbacks are going for uh, you know, in the teens and in the 20s. So uh, I'm very proud of the book. The publisher is excited about the book because it, it just shows how you can come to America with literally nothing and uh, work hard, have purpose, persevere, uh, have some good luck as well, and uh, meet wonderful people that help you along the way. And uh, you carve out a wonderful career uh, in America. And one last thing, I think you have a web page you could tell us about. Well, I write on Substack, murraysabrin.substack.com, and I write twice a week there. I hope to increase it in the future, but I write about uh, the economy, obviously, uh, and some politic, uh, political issues, because uh, we need to get out to the public better ideas than what's been uh, in Washington for so many decades, which is not proving to be helpful for the vast majority of the American people. And we have this incredible polarization because people are have these ideas that are not consistent with the vision of the founders for America. And uh, as an immigrant, I can speak, I think, very clearly on what I think America is all about, which is all about freedom and liberty. After all, the cover of the book is about is the Statue of Liberty, because that's the first thing I saw when I was an infant coming sailing up uh, New York Harbor and landing in Manhattan.
You've been watching the Biz News Podcast. We welcome your input. Send your email to editor at biznews.com. Thanks for watching.